Now it's my great pleasure to introduce someone who's travelled down from uh, Kendall to be with us, and that's our Comet Section Director, Stuart Atkinson. He's very well known in the, in the area for giving masses of talks and being um, a, a great ambassador for astronomy. And, as you know, being a Comet Section Director, you would expect him to be interested in comets, which he certainly is, and in particular the, the Rosetta, uh, the, the comet which uh, Rosetta visited. So he's going to talk about today comets, fear, fact and fiction. So, in a, with a brief pause while I attach this microphone to him, here's Stuart Atkinson. Right. Thank you very much. No pressure there, but that's good. So, yes, it's not going to be a serious talk, as you can probably guess from the opening slide, because I am, shock horror, not a scientist. I'm an amateur. Um, I'm a Comet fan, so this is a talk about... The fear of fact fiction of comets, lots of pretty pictures, lots of aren't they amazing, what will we see in the future, but we will not be seeing charts, equations, <laughs> graphs, is that okay? Absolute beginner stuff. So, comets. To start off with, where were you on New Year's Eve? That's not a police question, just wondering where you all were. Um, maybe to party, maybe you went down to the river and saw the fireworks. Where was I? Well, with my girlfriend, I spent New Year's Eve in a lay-by at Shap. Nothing mucky. No, 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 no. Why? Well, because through the day, the sun weather dials were twitching. It might be an northern lights display. Now, Shap's very high. We're quite further north from here. So around midnight, looking out from the van, we saw that. Not bad, yeah. At midnight, it turned into that. Good stuff. That's the north. I was looking that way. Because rising in the east was the star Arcturus. And that's my long suffering girlfriend, Stella. Stella, yes, I chose her name specially. So, um, it was a catalogue, so what can you do? So there's Arcturus. Arcturus. But close to Arcturus in binoculars, there was. Remember, northern lights blazing over there. I'm looking this way. There was a little fuzzy spot. Comet Catalina. So that was at midnight. At half past three on New Year's Day morning, I was still out, not with Stella, she'd gone to bed, because it was getting close to Arcturus, and that was through my driven camera. So there's Comet Catalina, with a nice two tails. Yeah. It's rubbish, isn't it, really? I mean, we want big, comet, big long tails and glowing things. This is best we've had for a long time. But most comets look like this, a little fuzzy ball, the hint of a tail, a bit of mist, they got not much better than that. But what are comets? What's the, what's the deal about them? Well, for a long time we thought comets were quite simple things. We knew comets pretty well. We thought comets were basically big dirty icebergs. So imagine a big iceberg, roll it in soot and dust and grit, fling it into space around the sun, melt, bits fly off, that was basically our idea of a comet. Big chunk of ice going around the sun like a mini planet, Melting, stuff comes off, refreezes, melts, stuff comes off, round the sun, blah, 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 blah. Not quite that simple, it turns out. But that was a view for a long, long time. A big chunk of ice orbiting the sun, stuff coming off it. But the orbits are very, very long with many comets. If you look at com who saw Comet Hell Bop in 1996? Yeah. Seven, yeah, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Well, it started six, then, just in 97. Yeah. So its orbit is a long, long orbit there. Okay. Halley, 76 year orbit. Comet Ikea Zhang there, 366 years. Some have got orbits of many thousands of years, some probably millions of years. Planet orbits, roughly circular. Comets, long, long loops. So most of the time, nothing happens. We're away from the sun, dark, cold, dead, lifeless. When they get near the sun, that's when stuff happens. We start to see them. So you look at a naked comet. Even the, the cloud here, this shot on the solar system. Many come from here, you see. So the long, 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 loopy ones spend millions of years out in space, come near the sun, turn on. But a naked comet is basically that. Big chunk of ice, very dark, and out here, away from the sun, it's just in there, nothing comes off it. As it nears the sun, it starts to get active. Bits start to fly off, it starts to melt, more sublime. Okay. Then we see little jets come away, 
a coma forms, gassy halo around the outside. Some get no further than that, they don't get near enough to the sun. They get near the sun, they really wake up. And you can see here from the Stardust mission, and these bits here, this is not static. These are snowball sized chunks of comet coming off the nucleus and being photographed by the space probe. So it's an active, messy area. Stuff flying off it all the time. And when you get to the sun, more stuff comes off and you form a longer tail sometimes, bigger gas cloud around it sometimes. But you're seeing here a, an iceberg, a snowball, melting in the heat of the sun. That's all comets are. Hale Bopp, 1996-1997. And had two very famous and very easily spotted tails. Got this long curving dust tail here, like a yellowy white pillar, and the straight plasma gas tail, like that. Now from a dark place, this was a really easy naked eye comet. The best naked eye comet for a long, long time. Since Hale Bopp, had a few not too bad comets, but mostly needed binoculars or a telescope. A few of nudged naked eye, from the Southern Hemisphere, I've seen lots of naked eye comets. McNaught, Lovejoy, probably a dozen or so since us. We are long overdue another naked eye comet. When will it come? No idea. But we'll look at some possibles later on. So most comets form at least one tail. Some you see two tails in the sky. Nice time lapse here showing material going down the tail of a comet. So if you look here, you can see stuff coming off the nucleus and working down. This is gas heading down the comet's tail. So comets do things, they move and they change and the stuff flies off and the tail develops, the tail comes, gets bigger, gets short again, bits detach and then ripple down the tail, called a disconnection event. So they're dynamic, they change. They've got a really bad reputation. They were blamed for lots of things in the past. And if you go back in history, we've got engravings and pictures showing comets destroying the Earth. The Germans especially, for some reason, really got a bad thing about comets. Their pictures show them ripping apart the earth and demons dancing and all sorts of things. Why? Look at this picture here from 40... We've got a two-headed dog eating a baby. That's not the comet's fault, seriously. Right? That's not even real. Look in the sky, you've got a comet and there's raining fire and blood on the ground. There's deformed babies and there's wars and all sorts of things. We can laugh now, yes, but this must have been for some reason. Why take comets so badly, so seriously? Why are people so scared of comets? 1910, you'd have thought we'd know better, but even then, people were buying gas masks because we went through the tail of Harley's Comet. Tiny amounts of cyanide gas in the comet's tail, totally harmless to us, but entrepreneurs, shall we call them, sold gas masks to stop people dying. Even before eBay came along, you could get, in 1910, Anti-comet pills. <laughs> now we laugh today at the stuff people saw on the internet, but total waste of money, of course. But people believed it. Why? Why are comets so, even in 1910, why were comets so scary for people? What's behind that? We don't know any better today. When Hell Bop came round, the Heaven's Gate cult, um, about 29 people committed suicide thinking it was going to carry them off to another star where it was better and unicorns danced on the grass and whatever. Because I believe this man who said, the comet is a spaceship, it'll carry you all the way to a better life. You'd think they'd know better, wouldn't you? But comets have this whole their imagination on our, on our fears that people believe all sorts of stuff. And it's not got any better still because 19, well, a couple of years ago, Comet Ison, the great comet that never was, and by then we got the insect and all sorts of nuts had crawled out from beneath their stones of this one. That people thought it was being followed by UFOs, it was going to hit the Earth, and it was going to cause plagues, and it was going to hit Mars, and Mars would hit the Earth. A bit of a long shot, that one, I think. But my favourite was this lady here. She just predicted all sorts of... She's now done this ten times for ten different comets. Predicted the end of the world ten times. And her favourites were, we've got... His eyes on Wormwood, he's been followed by UFOs. His eyes on the red hand of death. He's going to shower the earth in red flesh eating bacteria. No. But where does this stuff come from? <coughs> Game of Thrones had a red comet in the sky. We know how that ended up. Again, why? Why have they feared so much? Well, 
goes back to how the sky used to be appreciated by people, I think. Here's our modern sky. That's my sky from Kendall. A bit of light pollution, as you can probably see there. But we know our sky really well. We know we've got planets and stars. But our sky, the one important thing is, it changes in short terms. If you look at a normal night sky, there's stuff flying everywhere. You've got the space station. The space station there. You've got satellites. You've got planes. Iridium flares come and go. Come and go. The night sky is like a motorway now. The stuff everywhere. You turn, take a long exposure photograph and you get crisscross lines all over the place, don't you? But in the old days, none of that. Stars, planets, a few things moving. So go back in time. Let's go in the TARDIS and go back in time about maybe three or four hundred years. No space station, no, sun, no iridium flares. You have got the sky. And that is part of your natural world. You know this like the back of your hand. This is part of your world, like the river down there, that mountain, those forests, those trees. Doesn't change. This is comforting to you. know this like the back of your hand. Things do change now and again. Planets, they move, but slowly, over weeks and months. So that wouldn't freak you at all. That's a natural thing in the sky. Shooting stars. For a couple of seconds, whoosh, that's exciting, gone. When it's gone, nothing's changed. Chicken's still clucking, river's still tinkling, nothing's caught a fire, no one's died. A bright fireball, that'd be exciting. But when the flash has gone, the sonic boom's faded, again, the world is still the same. Nothing's changed. No drama. Then one morning, you're out feeding the cattle or taking in the eggs, and you see in the east that. That wasn't there the night before, the day before. And okay, that's strange, but it'll go away, ignore it, it's not, it must be a, a freaky thing. A few days later on, that has become that. Hmm. Ah, that shouldn't be there. That's a bit worrying. My normal, lovely, natural sky has got a stranger in it, a, a, a corrupter, an interloper. But maybe it'll go away, forget it, ignore it. Later on, that will come back. Now you are seriously worried. And if you then hear there's been a war, or a plague, or a battle, or a fascination, what will you blame? You will blame that. Because that wasn't there before. So we laugh now, but if you think back in that, in that time period, nothing moving in the sky. If this appears in the sky, that is something ruining your normal day-to-day -day sky. And that's why I think comets were blamed for being... The harbingers of doom and war assassinations. Because if you see that in the sky, something's obviously wrong with the universe, isn't it? That's a strange thing in the sky. And because of that difference, that's why I think we fear comets so much. Today we get warning. We see comets coming in from New York Cloud. We see comets out in Hubble photos. We look forward to it. But if I piss in your sky without any warning at all, you are going to really be scared. That's where the fear comes from, I think. But we observed comets for a long time. On Bayer Tapestry, we've got Halley's Comet up there. These big telescope, the optical telescopes looked at comets, 1910. I'm pretty sure that wasn't actually real, it's a cartoon. Wouldn't get a very good view from there, would you? But it shows our fascination with comets. And they are fascinating things. There have been some very good comets from the Southern Hemisphere. This is Comet McNaught um, from a few years ago. Lovely long head there, and the tail like a, a mare's tail stretching out that way. Our horizon, cut it off there. Yes, how happy was I about that? So. But from the southern hemisphere, this dominated the sunset sky for a good couple of weeks. We've been to comets. 1986, Giotto probe flew past Halley's Comet and took some pictures that were good for its time. Now we've got much better pictures of comets with Rosetta we'll see later on. But Giotto was amazing. If that hadn't happened, there would have been no Rosetta. It was a precursor to Rosetta. We sent probes to comets and we've sampled the dust. The Stardust probe flew through a comet's tail, collected dust, returned it back to Earth for study. We've got some amazing pictures there as well. But it's not been enough. Long distance observing. We need to go, go to a comet, orbit it and study it in real, and even if possible, land on it. Learn what they're made of, learn how they change, watch a comet grow and change over time. Hence Rosetta, the European mission. And here you can see the main orbiter there. Nesting in here, that's Philae, the lander, about the size of a large fridge. Um, this is a European mission. 
And you've all seen, you've all seen the photos, yeah? Yeah, amazing pictures. You'll see something there you have not seen before because I've made them using the raw data. But we'll, we'll come to that in a little while. So, March 2nd, 2004, Rosetta lifts off from its mighty Ariane 5 rocket. And it did not go straight to the comet. It took a very long looping orbit around it. visited Jupiter, an asteroid, went past Mars. Then went to sleep for a long time. That's precious. Imagine being the guy who puts it to sleep, has to wake it back up again. This multi-million pound probe going off to Rosetta to, to the comet. And you turn it off. It'll be fine. I don't like turning my laptop off. Never mind this multi-million dollar probe here. But luckily it all ended up well. It woke up again and took pictures of the... Comet 67P. Are you going to turn for me? Come on. Right, so, when it got to the comet, this was its first views, got the nickname the Rubber Duck Comet. Turns out it was actually two comets joined together. A twin lobe comet got a smaller part than a large, but probably we think, we're pretty sure now, in the past two comets collided and stuck together. But look, just like a rubber duck as it approached a comet there. Uh, and there's a nice sensor scale at the bottom there for you. I think your batteries have gone rubbish. Mm. So yeah, that's the arrival. That's July last year. I have to go to manual land. Okay. Approaching the comet. Yes, even space probes take selfies now. There's a comet seen through the rigging of the probe. This is actually taken by the Philae lander. The orbit has got some amazing cameras on it, very high resolution cameras. The lander has got some cameras too. That's a view from the lander looking through the solar panels, a gap in the solar panels, at the comet off in the distance. And the nearer we got, the better the pictures became, so more and more detail over time. Yeah, that's dead. It's so August 16th. That is not your nice round fluffy snowball, is it? Comets turn out to be gnarly, twisted, spire-covered, craggy, valid, crevassed, monstrous things. And this comet here, 67P, is clearly, you can see now, two comets stuck together. That was A, a bonus, because you got two for the price of one, and B, a pain because you've now got to do your comet flying around this very complicated body. If that was round, your flying is quite simple. Round you go, off a bit. But we're now with two comets tumbling, it's quite, make a much harder mission. But look at the detail already in this picture. You've got like flat bits, we've got cliffs, we've got flows of material, we've got craggy spires and all sorts. And since then, every day new photographs from Rosetta in really stunning detail. So how big is it? This gives you a sense of scale. Um, I can't remember, that's actually died, so I can't use that. So if we look at the size of the Empire State Building here, Eiffel Tower, that big tower in Saudi Arabia there. It's a big chunk of ice. That's still a bit hard to get your hands around. So compared to, say, Mount Fuji, how big would it be? It would be that big. And this is a small comet. Hellbop was 20 miles across. This is a baby compared to Hellbop. On a more familiar scale, what might you see if it was hovering over London? That size. Okay. Or to be more contemporary, how big compared to, say, the Death Star? There you go, that's for me. So, yeah. Not scientific, but pays by talk, so I enjoy it. August 23rd, we're now getting quite low orbit, getting amazing details. And now we can see in real detail the mountains on the comet. We're seeing boulders everywhere, there are flows of material. You can see the bottom of some cracks. I can just point those out here because this has died. These cracks here. That's where the ground's actually falling away beneath. The dusty level, so we're seeing a crack in the ground there. But the detail was incredible. The Osiris cameras are like spy cameras attached to this space probe. So we're seeing boulders there, several metres across. Look at the horizon. One very high resolution photo you will not have seen before. It's actually one sneaked out from the ESA archives. And what did they see on the horizon? Well, actually what they saw was, and I haven't released this, that's what we saw. Um, <laughs> that might be a fake. I'm not prepared to comment, but you never know. So. The big day, November 12th. That was when Melanda was going to detach from the probe, go down to the comet, 
land safely, legs open out, harpoons fire, test the comet, taste the comet, take samples, analyse it, job done. <laughs> Sounds simple. Not simple at all, because you've got this fridge size probe made of tinkly glass and delicate electronics and lenses and computers. You want to land it on a tumbling ball of ice the size of Mount Fuji. So behind the landing site, you want someone that's not too boring, because you want to see stuff on the ground, but not too hard either, because you want to land safely. The best place, the most interesting place is covered in rocks and boulders, cracks, crevasses, mountains. Great to look at, but a pig to land on. Not a good idea. So you want somewhere quite flat, quite boring, but reasonably safe. So they chose a place called Ajilka. See the red cross up the top there? Near the big crater there. And we mapped it in great detail. And this was a plan. Little filler would land on the surface. Legs would spring out. Harpoons fire to select it, to, to secure it to the surface. Robo sound would come out. Take samples, bring it back in again. And analyse it. That was the plan. Amazing technology. Amazing piece of kit, this. <coughs> That's a landing site. Doesn't that look lovely and friendly and flat and featureless? Yeah. A few rocks here and there. Looks like a nice, flat, dusty plane. Until you add scale, that shows you nothing, does it? There could be stones that size. Let's put some numbers on this landing site. There you go. So those little stones turn out to be 20 metres across. That's the size of a jumbo jet compared to the landing site. And you're landing a, a probe the size of probably this desk on the surface. And you can't steer it. You're aiming for a point on the surface and gravity's taken over it and physics taken over the rest of it. You fire off with a spring, it's going down, it can't guide itself. So you're hoping that you're going to land in this area here somewhere where there's no boulders, no cliffs, no rocks, no crevasses. Yeah, good luck with that. It was like that. Now, you've seen the film Armageddon, it gets a lot of stick Armageddon because there's stuff flying. It turns out it wasn't too far off the truth, actually, because you've got these crevasses on the surface, you've got things flying from the air, there's jets of gas and dust shooting up. Not at fearless landing time, quite inert, but the part of the surface of a comet looked just like part of a comet in Armageddon. Rocks and boulders and craggy bits and all sorts. So that's the landing scenario. And unguided, you're going down the place you think is the best place you can get to on the comet for that time. So it's like flying over the Cumbrian Fells and dropping an egg. I'm hoping you land somewhere there's not too many rocks. Hope to land some grass. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong there? So what happened on the day? Well, as it turned out, it went pretty well. So this is looking down from Rosetta, watching Philae descend into the darkness, that walking speed going down. See the legs have already come out. So that's looking down. The probe landing looked back up again at the Rosetta lander, at the Rosetta orbiter, sorry, and took that picture. I love that picture. I think it's very grainy and there's lens flares like a J.G. Abrams film. But you've got the solar panels and the sunlight streaming in. And I just love that picture. So here's the actual plan. Okay, legs come out, drops down, harpoons fire. Okay, fine. Because small body, low gravity, you're going to bounce back off again. So the harpoons are meant to fire off, fly into the ice, drill down, hold the, rope, the, the lander down in place to do science. That was the plan. Landing at walking speed, as I say on the slide there. Nail-biting tension. We all watched live on the internet watching this happen. And then big cheers. Yay, Philae was down. Briefly, he thought, this is boring, I'm going to go somewhere else. And it took off again, because the harpoons didn't fire. It landed three times. And it buoyed across the surface to actually find its landing place in the end. So it didn't go quite as planned. But on Twitter, they celebrated. It's a big social media mission, Rosetta. And it tweeted from the surface of a comet. My new address, yeah, temporary address, it moved somewhere else and then somewhere else again. It bounced across the comet surface. 
But this was great fun to watch. I've done a magnificent job on outreach now. ESA. ESA used to be rubbish at outreach. They really did. Way behind NASA. But now they've got Twitter accounts, they've got lots of quizzes. The websites on ESA page are fantastic. Lots of interaction, lots of bands, lots of things to actually do and see. And in social media terms, Rosetta was an amazing mission successfully. But that was a photograph from the lander. We hope to see a lovely big country plain with some hills or some jets, maybe some stones. And we saw that. Its nose was up against the icy surface of a comet. And that is one of the legs. That should be like that. It's like that. Not a good sign at all. Because you need a landing site which is flat to do these experiments, to reach out with the arm, grab some samples, bring it back in. You need to be landing like that. It didn't land like that. That was one theory, but did isn't actually what happened. Um, but that might have been actually been a bit better, because the truth of what happened, it landed, and then landed again, and flew across the comet's surface, looking for the worst place it could possibly find to land in. So rather than a flat plane, it landed on the side of a cliff, in a hole, in the shadows, upside down. Good job, well done, well done, yeah. So, it couldn't have been worse unless it actually blown up on landing, really. You'd have seen that if you'd been with the comet. That should have landed flat, right, to reach up the arm, take samples, do experiments. So it's now kissing a cliff of ice on the comet. Sunlight is fading rapidly for this solar-powered lander, and... Not a good day, but it's still awake, still doing science. The batch is going to start to, to fade rapidly now. So for a day, they got every drop of science they possibly could from this lander. And they got back most of what we wanted to for the first stage of the landing. Amazing achievement itself. Creasing this to get the science out of it, as much as it possibly could. And we watched this online. The people bustling around and the graphs showing the charts and things. It was a fascinating but really frustrating watch. They worked on this for 10, probably 20 years, some people. And they'd seen this not come to nothing, but come to a very premature halt. So we all watched this, what's happening. And then we saw, just before midnight, the power levels start to drop through the floor. Battery discharging, that was the end of the mission, really. For the lander, anyway got to go to sleep. The plan was it would actually go to sleep, recharge, wake up again. But it's in the shadows now. It's not going to recharge. So this was it for the lander's actual first stage mission. And the graph, look, it's just dropped. Vump. And it was like the end of 2001. We're seeing Daisy, Daisy. It's getting slower and slower. Things are slowing down. It's getting very quiet. Lots of wailing on Twitter. Oh, we're going to, it's going to die. And... But very sad watching this. Got quite a personality, this little lander, on Twitter. And then it finally went to sleep. That's a picture that I made for Twitter, which got shared just under 45,000 times in an hour, went around the world. But he was actually asleep. And they're doing good science, but it's a great shame. Someone tweeted a rather heart-rending picture like that. Which I thought was really funny. <laughs> but, but, seriously, it had done some good science. It's not going to wake up again, we don't think. There's a few false alarms late last year. We've got a few blips through the actual ether from Philae. But it's, we think it's dead now, so we won't hear back from Philae again. But it sent back amazing pictures of the orbit itself. And you'll have seen these on, online, I'm sure, on magazines and websites and all sorts. But... ESA now, to their credit, and they didn't used to do this, release raw pictures online. And they let people like me, who've got far too much free time on their hands, play with these images and make, not better, but different views. So we take these raw images, and we enhance them, sharpen them, burn bits, change bits around, to make pretty pictures. Not useful, not accurate, but just visions of this comet. So you'll see lots of pictures I've actually made, as artistic views, really, 
of the comet. So I hope you like these. So that's looking over from the large lobe across that great chasm to the smaller lobe in the distance. That's quite a striking view, isn't it? The ice cliffs and the crags in there. So. Then you've got one of the jets shooting out there. So when we see comets from the Earth, that's what we think. The stuff shooting off the comet nucleus, forming a tail, shooting away from the comet's central body there. It's a real close-up view of this. So we're looking at one of the cliffs lying flat. That boulder's probably the size of this table. Standing on the surface of the comet, casting a shadow behind it there. And see the crumbling cliffs on the top there. I love that view, the sense of scale. An astronaut would be sort of like that size of that boulder, I think, if you're standing on the comet. Look at the long shadow being cast by that boulder. So you would see this. If you were flying around the comet in a, in a spaceship, looking out the window, you would see that view. It's a very dark, very black and white body. Hints of red, maybe. Hints of grey. Hints of blue in the icy bits. But you would see a very stark monochromatic landscape, and the boulders of the rocks casting long shadows across the surface, going for miles in some cases. Stunning view. That has been colourised to make it look a bit more blue. That's not what you would see, but it just shows you the gas lifting off the comet's surface there. So these are real photographs, but played about with a little bit. December 15th, we saw the cliffs. Now, remember, this is tumbling, so they're not cliffs all the time. At this orientation, those things over there are cliffs, because they're vertical. When it's turned a bit more, that will become a floor. Okay? When it's turned more, that will then become underneath you. On the other side, cliffs again. So it's all relative. This is moving all the time. Not very quickly, but it's actually tumbling through space. But I saw this as what I can do something with this. I thought, isolate those cliffs to make it much more vertical, just purely for artistic purposes, not scientifically useful at all. And I got that. That's quite striking, isn't it? And that got picked up by papers across the UK and across the world, and that has been Astronomy Picture of the Day on the NASA website. When they weren't using fake pictures, like they are now for a bit, but anyway. Oops, slips out. Um, but yeah, it's just a stunning view. But imagine standing underneath here. You'd be the size, probably, of that rock there. Probably a little bit smaller. Looking up at those towering cliffs of ice way above you. And then as it turns, you would see that drop down, like in, in film Inception, like those skyscrapers. It would lower down. You'd be looking across this icy place. And it would tip beneath you and roll around again. Amazing place. I love the detail on this. And again, you see the ground actually falling away. This is eroding here. So that ground's collapsing. This is all dust, very dry, very thick dust. Collapsing into a hole there. You see the rocks and the bold casting shadows behind it. Hills on the top there. Lots of boulders everywhere. A pancake shape here. That's a raised area from the surface. This is a surprise. Because what we're seeing here is a hole. And there's something pouring out of it. It's a fluid. Not a it's actually a fluid. This was a big surprise because we thought comets were basically inert. It went from a solid to a gas, sublimely straight away. They wouldn't expect to see things on the surface flowing, but something is pouring out of there, like syrup almost, belching out of this hole and spreading across the surface of the comet, and spreading across and covering the ice and the rocks and the dust. That was a, a big surprise. That. Then we saw this. That's a very important photograph, that. This is looking into one of the vents where the gas comes shooting out of. And can you see the little round objects in the crater wall there? We think they're the building blocks of the planets. Very basic building blocks from the birth of the solar system. So when the planets were being formed, they were formed out of, we think, bits like that. Like tennis ball sized things. They then clumped together to form rocks, to form boulders, to form planets. So if people ever land on a comet, they want to go to one of these places here and sample these because these are fossils from the birth of the solar system. Which comets have themselves, actually. Leftovers. 
but these bits here, these round objects, they could be the holy grail of planet formation science. So we need to do some more work on those. I love this picture, the contrast on this. You've got two great icy spires shooting into the sky. And you look at the cliffs and the, the shadows there. Striking view. And the comet is so dark, you just about see that through your spaceship window. You're looking at a black comet against a blacker sky. So maybe if you're shining a light from your spaceship, you would see that view. Now, of course, it's the ice fortress. That's a real place on the comet's surface, on the small lobe. And you can see we've got dust ripples on the ground there. We've got towering spires and there's rocks, like a scree field here. There's rocks tumbling off there to spread across the surface. Some probably bounced off, landed somewhere else. You see layers in the cliffs. Fascinating place. When it moved out, we saw the whole comet in the field of view. And now we're seeing the jets and the gas shooting off the comet's nucleus. And... That's quite striking, isn't it? You're still seeing the craters and the cliffs and the rocks, and so, but now we're seeing the jets shooting off the nucleus, glowing in the sunlight. And if you really torture it to make it look... There you go. Now we can see the details on the cliffs, usually in shadow. And we see there are layers and there are bits peeling off, there's slumping, and there's just incredible detail on the cliff faces there. And these little bits, you see the little like, white bits are off the nucleus? They are bits of comet, which have gone off the nucleus and now orbiting the comet like mini moons. It's got moons of its own bits and pieces. It's coming to an end. In September, Rosetta will land, i.e. crash as slowly as possible, on the surface of the comet. And if it goes well, it will land quite so it'll probably go to like a skidding halt. They land at a low angle, and if it lands without breaking into little bits, we might see what Phil didn't show us. We might see this landscape with cliffs and some cracks and some boulders and some jets shooting off into the sky. More likely, it'll just go bang and that'll be it. But we could cross our fingers for a landing which will be controlled enough to get some final pictures from the surface of the comet. I'll have to wait and see. But comets in the sky, there have been some absolutely amazing sights in the sky, not for a long time. But going back in history, um, the last couple of hundred years there have been some spectacular comets. Donatis Comet, 1859, just glowing trail of light in the sky. Imagine seeing this when you walk outside tonight, over the buildings, over the sky, over Tower Bridge, over Big Ben. Imagine seeing that in the sky. We're long overdue one like this. Comet Hikataki, 1996. This was a lovely comet. This had a tail, at its best, 90 degrees long in the sky. 90 degrees. From the middle of a town, this was like a searchlight beam in the sky. From the countryside, this was like someone got a, a World War II search beam shining in the sky. It just whooshed across half the sky. A beautiful lavender blue colour as well. Anybody see Hikataki? Yeah. The year before, Hellbop was at its best, yeah. And it went very near Polaris, so very easy to see. Good northern hemisphere comet. And then, of course, Hellbop came along, this lovely twin tails. This was the most observed comet for a long, long time, I think. And this, people saw this from parks and playgrounds and streets and just putting the cat out, walking the dog. It was just, it was slap across the face, bright in the sky. I've not seen its like since in the northern hemisphere, which is a great shame. Comet McNaught, was off in the Southern Hemisphere, 2006, was a lovely comet. Really big, bright, bright head, a scimitar curving tail. And that slowly developed into a much more impressive object. It became that. Wouldn't that be, that's Venus, low down on the horizon there. As I said, our horizon cut off just above the top of the tail there. But not jealous at all. Comet Lovejoy, 2011 was a lovely Ikea Seculite comet with a long, long tail, a bit of a fork on the end. But from the southern hemisphere, it was about the size of your arm, held at arm's length like that. Really long tail. Even seen from the space station. Photograph from the space station. That's from the space station window. You've got a lovely 
horizon there, the Earth's in the curve loom. So yeah, I may get paid for that. That's not fair, is it? So we missed that. We're long overdue a good one. Comet Lovejoy in 2013 wasn't bad. This is the, the last half decent comet, really. This is a binocular comet. Naked eye, it was just like a little green star with a hint of a tadpole tail behind it. Through binoculars, it was very pretty. Um, but this was after Comet Ison failed to do anything at all. This is a big letdown. But this has been the best one for a long time. Since then, comets have been really fuzzy stars in an eyepiece that are an absolute pig to find on a dark night, if we get a dark night. We're long overdue a really, really good one. So these comets here are not typical of comets we see in the sky. Yeah. Usually we see this through a telescope eyepiece or binoculars, a little fuzzy smudge. Imagine you've got a blackboard and some white chalk just on your finger, and you do that. That's what they look like. And that's a good comet, usually. And on any night of the year, you see probably half a dozen of these if you know where to look. Just a smudge in an eyepiece. Occasionally they get brighter and it's helpful, but most never get further than this in an eyepiece. That's Catalina from earlier this year. That's what you guys saw through my telescope. If you're lucky, then they start to form a tail. Most don't do that. Most are little puff balls in an eyepiece. If you're really lucky, then the tail gets a bit brighter, and we've seen something more like this through a telescope. Comet Catalina looked a little bit like that on the darkest of moon-free clear nights over New Year. But since then, not much. Since then, there's been about three comets in the sky, which have just about been binocular comets. But naked eye, nothing. Very poor time. This is where I do my observing from Kendall Castle in Kendall. Can you see the comet on here? Yeah, yeah just. It's that little smudge above the top tower there. Pan stars from about two, three years ago. Very close to M31, it's April the 5th, 2013, yeah? yeah? Very, very pretty. It was quite nice, yeah? But it's not what we're waiting for. This would only, you'd not see this from a light polluted town. It'd have to be somewhere dark, away from street lights, looking in the right place. About M13 size in the sky. And this is a long exposure photograph. Look nothing like that for naked eye at all. It was just a barely there smudge in the sky. When's the next one coming? When's the next hell bubble higher Kataki? We don't have a clue. We look at the space all the time. We know there's a few comets heading away that will not become great comets. Orbits are wrong. They won't be near the Earth at the same time near the Sun. It's got to be a comet coming near the Sun and the Earth at the same time. The right angle, an active comet, a large comet, that would make a great comet. There's nothing in our sky heading our way now that will become a great comet. We might have a naked eye one just about in September, October time. Very low down, but don't count on it. But a great comet, when's it going to happen? Any day, we could find it. Might be next year, might be ten years' time. But somebody somewhere will find on a photographic plate a little fuzzy dot. Looks nothing at all. But when you crunch the numbers, that will be, hang on, look what that will be at that time. If it all works out, it will do what Ison did before it broke to bits, the useless thing. Come near the Earth at the same time. Then we could be in for a proper great comet in the sky. Another Hell Bop. Another Haikataki, maybe. Another Comet West, one of these famous comets. And when that happens, we'll have warning. In the old days, no warning just appeared in the sky. Now we probably get maybe two years warning of a great comet in the sky. So we could produce magazines and books and charts, and then it's cloudy and we won't see it. But, but we'll get warning, that's the main important point. And it will start off as this, before sunrise or, before, or after sunset. Just a faint star with a bit of a tail. And if it behaves itself, which we often do, mostly don't, comets often just fling us a complete curveball and either fizzle out or break to bits or just fade away completely. Then it might possibly become that. I would take that quite happily. 
having had four years of little smudges in the nineties. But with a truly great comet, that's not enough. What you want is a long tail and a bright head, something in the sky that deserves the word great. We want something like that. That has been seen before. That's what I've done in Photoshop to show a great comet above Kendall. We are due one of these. That's not made up. That's what we can expect to see, hopefully, sometime. If, you all, if all the numbers all crunch in the right possible way, we should see one of these in our lifetimes. We should have seen four of these since Hale Bob. Look at the numbers. We're in a real quiet period at the moment. So any day now, somebody might find a little smudge which will go to become something like that. Maybe the optimistic might turn into something like that. We can only hope. They've been seen before. Many times have seen before like comments like this. But not by us. We've been cheated something rotten here. We really are. I don't want to sound bitter. But yeah, I'm bitter. It's not fair. We should be seeing something like this. But one day, somebody will find on a photograph a smudge which will become something like that. Hopefully in the northern sky... Um, we've been in Australia many, many times before, but it should be our turn. So cross our fingers. But when? We don't know. But it's out there right now. It's out in the darkness of space, waiting to be found. Somebody will spot it. Might be today. Might have been found this morning. Might have been used to go home tonight. Comet X will be a bright naked eye comet next year. This might be in ten years' time. We don't know. But out there right now, this very second is the next great comet to grace our skies. We'll have to wait. So to finish off with, in the future, 2069 has its comets back. A landing will not be enough. We will probably send people in 2069. So maybe your grandchildren will be on that mission. So maybe someone in here, their grandkid, will walk on Halley's Comet in the future, look at Earth, there's a little blue star in the sky, and not be afraid of comets. We'll finally conquer comets by walking on them and looking back at the Earth. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Stuart. Sorry about the battery failure there. Okay. Uh, let's uh, run it. Oh, that's in control. There we go. Um, so I've got a bit of time for questions and comments. Not to mention the comets. Jim. Apparently, the reason why the uh, bolts didn't fire on Philae was that they used an explosive which has got a life in space of 12 or 24 months. Right. That was clever, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, have you made a photograph of the uh, recent um, comet at Bypass Mars? Ah, oh, that would have looked more awesome. They took photos from the rovers. I didn't see anything. It was just too faint, and there's too much dust in the air from Mars. If it had been the moon, it might have seen like a faint hint in the sky. They did get a little hint of a smudge, maybe on a few photographs, but no hint of a tail, no bright star, just a smudgy, mudgy thing. But, so but from the Earth, term? it was a very, very faint comet at all. Technical term, that smudgy, mudgy. Smudgy, mudgy, yeah. That's a NASA term, that, yeah. Did you take that photograph over Kendrick Castle yourself? Yes, yeah. And it's just one photograph? That's one photograph, yeah. yeah. That was a Canon 1100D camera with a 50mm lens on, about a four second exposure, really high ISO though. But it's, it's quite dark up there, so it's, it's not too bad at all. I think it's true to say that photographs taken with DSLRs show a lot more than... Oh yeah, the absolutely, yeah. yeah. I couldn't yeah. see it like that at all. I knew it was in the right place, because it was next to that bright star. So. But naked eye, it was, it was not naked eye at all. It was a four second exposure with yeah. DSLR. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> high, high, high film speed, as we used to call it. Yeah. John, actually, like that. Sure, I love your um, optimism, and I really hope you're going to be bored. But is there anything uh, about comets, orbital mechanics, that makes the southern hemisphere get more than their fair share? I don't know. I've asked this before, but you just think it's p pure luck. Um, look at statistics over, over history. There's, been, there's no bias. But recently, because we're all looking at pictures on the internet now on space weather, we want to see it ourselves. It's on the internet all the time. They've been southern hemisphere. It's just really annoyed us. <laughs> but if you look at the graphs going over history, there's, there's no bias north or south. 
I mean, we saw the features from like Denati, some of they were Northern Hemisphere comics. Um, Halley in '86 was best in the Southern Hemisphere, but before that, it was a very bright, naked eye Northern comic in 1910. So there's no actual statistical bias; it's just not fair. Well, one point is that in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a lot of cities, and so most people are in the cities. In the Southern Hemisphere, uh, I was in Sydney a month ago, and I was surprised. 15 miles outside the centre of, Sid of Sydney, how dark the skies really were. It was more of a garden suburb than a, a city, and everything was spread out. The, the skies were definitely darker. Those pictures of Donati's Comet and others that, that, that you see, they were taken when skies were much darker, and you have pictures of Donati's Comet over Paris, over Cambridge, Massachusetts, over, and comets over London, and you could see the whole tale. Today, same thing that would appear, and we would not see it as well. But I agree with you that, that they've had some super comets. I mean, some of them have got the Milky Way core overhead, Magellanic clouds. Come on, mm. give us a break. Mm. Eh? It's, it's our turn next time. So, good cricket team. I mean, I suggested that the 67P is made up of two comets. Yeah. Chances of that. Um, well, space is very big with lots of stuff in it, but remote chances, yes, but it has happened. They've analysed it, and it's two different compositions of these two lobes, so they know it's actually two different comets. So the gravity well, is not quite enough to... Well, see, they'd nudge and then probably f go apart again and nudge together again. Um, I don't know how these things work, but it's like the, sol like the planets formed, things coming together in space. Some will stick, some will bounce off. But they, they approach at very low speeds and probably like, plough into each other and then, like, shudder and then come to a halt. But they are definitely two different lobes of a comet. A large number of asteroids and minor planets and so on, dwarf planets, do mm. have uh, companions. Yeah, well, we see lots of comets actually out in, in the solar system with spaceships that are multiple comets. Like two of them, possibly one might even be three bits joined together. Halley's might be a double comet, we're not, even, we're not quite sure yet. But we've seen different comets, definitely two lobes joined together. David again. When Halley's comet was on the way in last time, there was efforts to recover it as soon as possible. Yeah. And it's the first time we've had the technology to be able to follow it all the way around. Mm. Mm. It's now eight years away from its maximum distance. Mm -hmm. Is anybody following it? Has it been photographed? Probably some, yeah, just to keep like, a benchmark on it and see how it's evolving and changing, because Rosetta's main goal is to watch a comet <coughs> develop and grow, watch it get active and then fall asleep again. So, like Halley and hale -Bopp, they follow these as much as they can just to get this baseline measurement to see how things change. So I'm sure there's someone somewhere monitoring it regularly. I've not heard anything, now. It'd be quite a low-key field, I would think. But as you say, to get the information, it's probably a very useful thing, that. Yes, you. How did Rosetta react when uh, the Comet 67 reached the uh, perihelion nearest to the Sun? Well, we thought it might break in two. It didn't do that. Um, some thought, hooray, some thought, we really want to see this amazing breaking up. But it didn't react. It, it got... Brighter, more jets shoot off it, but nothing earth shattering happened at all. You said, How did Ro Rosetta react? Do you yes. mean the, uh, the, land, the lander or the actual orbiter? Uh, well, well, the orbiter takes some very fancy flying because it, the orbit's not a simple circle. It's like V's and triangles and all sorts of. It's like a spirograph pattern, the orbit of the, the lander and the comet. Um, so you've got to move out of it because there's so much stuff flying off it. You don't want to be pummeled by rocks and dust and gas and all sorts. So they pulled away a bit to take longer photos and like a, a wider field of view and then came back in again. So it's a very active... It's a dangerous place for a, for a probe. You've, imagine flying this screen to a comet, and you've got a snowstorm of hail and rocks and dust. It's not a safe place to be, so they moved away, looked back, and kept as safe as possible. The lander is probably dead now, but it didn't wake up through perihelion. What's the object crashing this thing onto it? Well, it can't go anywhere else, so it's got to land on the comet, really. It can't go to another comet. It's got no, no more propellant, I mentioned before. So you're hoping that when you land on it, you will get more photographs and see if you land on the comet safely, you will see the landscapes of, of hills and some rocks and some craters, and you'll actually see on the surface. I mean, why not? It's, it's worth a try. It's not going anywhere else. They can't do anything else with it. But it might, if it lands semi-safely, we'll get three or four photos, which you wouldn't have got otherwise, so... 
It's worth a try. Sean again? Yeah, presumably on its way in, it will be taking photographs. So oh, yeah. Even yeah. if it crashes, you will have got yeah. closer. Because there's nothing left to lose, you see. They'll take, they'll, they will hammer it to get as many photographs as possible. The rear run of those re early Ranger missions to the moon, Ranger 7, mm. you remember mm. the, when yeah. we were kids. Uh, mm. Amazing. You, you got right down mm. within a mm. metre of the surface and still taking photographs. It's, it's going to be, it's be a long loop in. We're not going to just suddenly one day go... Aah. It's going to be like a <laughs> slow, low, like a spiralling orbit down. And they'll aim to land it almost like this, like, like that. Rather than bang, which would not be a good day. It's you an, want it's like an SPA right connection with something you mentioned, okay. and that is you said how good S, uh, ESA are mm. at publicity these days. Um, our own Emily Baldwin, who used to be our chief, chief star, stargazer, is now working for yeah. the publicity. Doing an amazing job. And uh, on uh, at ESA, and uh, that's one reason for it. Mm. So, good bit of SBA background there. Mm. Popular astronomy, you see. That's what does it. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Well, NASA managed to land. On an, on an asteroid a few years mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. that was on Eros, that was a yeah. very complicated shape, so it mm. is possible. Oh, it's definitely possible, yeah. It's, it's, it's in the possible stroke worth a try, give it a go category. And um, the, the if Japanese it, are a bit upset that nobody remembers the Hayabusa mm. mission to an asteroid, which actually landed on the asteroid, took samples and brought them back. Mm. It's only got a few grains yeah. back, but it did actually get grains back, and they're doing another one right now. Ideally, wanted to land on a place which is not as boring as the original landing site. We have a landscape with, with cliffs and some hills and some rocks and a jet uh, and a clangor bouncing across. But we won't see that. But fingers crossed, it, it, it's worth a try. If you don't try, they've wasted a big opportunity. We might get amazing, we might just have a camera landing. It might have the cameras facing down. But we'll see. We're starting to be able to recover the photos though. We're beaming them back down to the earth, yeah, so we're beaming it live from the spaceship. What so we'll get photos. Well, we don't know, but it can't go anywhere else. It can't go to another comet because it's, it's almost dead of propellant. Um, it can't change course and head off somewhere else. Um, so it's a case of, well, what we're going to do with it, it's worth a shot. OK, uh, drawing the meeting to a close there. Thanks very much indeed to Stuart. We are dis um, comets are being discovered all the time. You may be surprised to know how many com comets are discovered. We see the discovery notices literally one every couple of weeks, if, if not more. But whenever I look at the, the new ones and I see that I look at the perihelion distance and it's <coughs> four or five astronomical units mm. and I think uh, no chance there. But occasionally we get one with a really close perihelion distance and hopefully uh, <coughs> we'll have one. Who knows, as you say, it could be any day now or it could be 10 or 20 years. We keep, have to keep yes, our fingers crossed. Right. Linked to impending disasters and doom and gloom. We've only got to wait till the 24th of June, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Either way. <laughs> On the, yes, that's, that's right. Who knows what will we'll happen? Know. You'll know we have a great comet just before it hits us. Well, that will be regarded as an omen by both sides. That's for, that's what, that you can be sure. OK, well, thanks very much indeed to Stuart. Thank you all for coming. Uh, next, uh, next meeting, as uh, Tim said, we have got a speaker from, the Royal, uh, from, from Edinburgh, from Glasgow, sorry, talking about gravitational waves. We think that will be a popular meeting, uh, latest information. And also, in the second half, we will be talking about your favourite Milky Way objects for those who are going to be looking up at the sky during the summer months. And if anyone would like to contribute to that, uh, then please let me know and uh, you can have a few minutes in the meeting. Okay, love to see you there. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. <laughs>